hour is dark and it's hard to see what you are doing here in the ruins and where this will lead oh but i know that down through the years i'll look at this moment i'll see your hand on it and know you were here and i'll testify of the battles you've won how you were my portion when there wasn't enough and i'll testify of the seas that we crossed the waters you parted the waves that i Story I'll tell. Whoa. 
I'm already tore up. Let me tell you, Patrick and I go way back to high school. We used to butt heads on the football field and pregame to get each other fired up. And we're fired up this morning. Um, I'm ready to go. Are y'all ready to go? Y'all give me a minute. I'm going to get my thoughts together, get my emotions together. We're going to talk about an amazing God today, an incredible God. And I'll quit trembling in just a minute. That song meant so much to my family and to my wife and I. Thank you, Patrick, for sharing it. But here's the title of my uh, testimony today. Some of y'all have heard this. I've shared it in a deacon's meeting. I've shared it with my families. And uh, it's an amazing thing for me, and I hope it's an amazing experience for you just to hear about it, how great our God is. But I titled this testimony, the story I'll tell, and that's this song. And it says, A COVID Survivor's Message of Prayer and Praise. Um, to be able to stand before you today is nothing short than an amazing, an amazing miracle full of God's wonderful grace, his wonderful mercy, his wonderful blessings that once again reveals to us the extraordinary relationship that he desires with each one of us individually, collectively as the church. He wants it all. What? It does, it bears witness to the power of calling his name and to the power of prayer. And we have forgotten that, church. And I'm sorry to call us out. I'm calling myself out. But we have forgotten the power of his name and the power of prayer. Sit back. We're going to get a reminder today. What a journey this has been for me and my family, one that will ever change our lives. In our relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, whom this testimony is all about. I don't leave any doubt this is not about me. This is all about him, not us, just him. So if I stray in any way make you think it's about me or someone else, it's not. It's about him. So we're going to go back, and there's a distinct passage of Scripture that has a story behind it we're going to look at it's the only passage we're going to have today if you want to look in first peter chapter five y'all can be looking there and i'll be telling you the background of that in may 17 2020 almost a month uh to the day brother mike preached on first peter chapter five okay and y'all y'all understand a little more as this goes uh my wife heard that sermon she wrote down this scripture and in the days that she was recently diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, she claimed this and put it to memory and put it in her heart. Six months later, we're revisiting that, and we're claiming this is our scripture for our family and uh, what it means to us. So that's why we're choosing it. But as y'all know, I'm a physician here in town. We've had COVID going on. It's affected everyone. Nobody's immune to the effects of COVID. But I was fortunate as a physician. I didn't have many patients that got that sick early on we were lucky people were doing what they're supposed to do they listened you know they took care of themselves we had some patients that got sick but not to the point that we saw last fall so long comes october and in october of this year my patients began getting sicker and sicker and more frequently and in October, I found myself in the hospital treating patient after patient after patient of my own and seeing other people's patients and family members with COVID. It was a, it was a terrible time. Y'all know that. Y'all are aware of that. Y'all have had family members affecting that. So moving forward from here, I just have to say, this is not a sermon but a testimony, but I learned one thing from Brother Mike is you make bullet points, you make an outline, you stick to it. So we're going to have one. And the first point I want to talk about today is the humbling of the invincible. The humbling of the invincible. And if any of y'all have ever seen the old Rocky and Bullwinkle show, you know they always gave a, a two-title thing at the end. Or it could be this. The second title of this is The How Dare You Ego of a Christian Doctor. COVID. Okay. It just rattles in everybody's head. You know, the SARS, COVID-2. You know, we hear it. What do you name it? 
the vid. You know, you hear it that COVID. It's just all been shrunk down. Well, I was, I was there, doing my part, treating patients, going in there. You know, I was in the fire. You know, looking for people to say, "Oh, there's Dr. Johnson. He's treating COVID patients, chest out, head high, skipping through a minefield of COVID patients every day, with a cavalier smile, thinking." I'm here doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm in the battle, but I'm invincible, and I'm in the battle. And you go in these rooms, and you'd stand at the door covered in protective gear, face masks, shields, and you'd crack open the door because in the back of your head, you're scared of it. You don't want what they have, but you still got to be their doctor. You can't go in there and lay your hand on them. You can't hug them. You can't hold their hands. But from the door, you doing okay? Your numbers look good. We're praying for you. Next one, check. Did my duty for the day. Move to the next patient. I was not cavalier about my fear of that disease. Two masks, three masks, four masks, five. As many as I could get on. As much gown as I could get on. As many gloves as I could get on. As many times as I could use Germex. I put it on and tried to stay safe. But nonetheless, in the middle of the night, the week before I went to the hospital, there was a little dry cough that started. Just a little cough. <coughs> I was prone to do that anyway. Prone to have a little cough. I said, no, that's not COVID. Not me. I'm not going to get it. I protected myself. You know, I've been very cautious. My family's been living on the farm for several months. We've not been doing anything we shouldn't do. It's not me. It's not me. It's not me. Just denying the fact that I didn't have it. Went to the extent of his coming around to Thanksgiving, treating COVID patients at the urging of my wife. I said, I'll just get checked out just to be sure. Went by, got a chest x-ray, completely clear. COVID negative. Doing good. Kept on working. Kept on seeing patients in the hospital. Kept on doing my duties, you know, trying to be bigger than, I, than I'm not. Started getting sicker and sicker, weaker and weaker. Um, I was seeing COVID patients anyway. Back in my mind said, you probably got COVID. But who's going to see them? Got to go, got to go. You know, follow my sore type attitude. Well, the stubbornness of a Superman, you know, that's why I labeled this, with symptoms progressing, my capes exposed, you know, and uh, I'm at home. My wife's caring for me. My family's caring for me. The rest of my family hadn't seen me in a week because I couldn't get out of the house. I thought I was getting better. Weak, coughing, felt like a bad flu, just thought I was getting better. Actually, the morning that I was hospitalized, I woke up without a cough. Amanda thought, wow, he's getting better. He's getting better. This is going to be the day where he flips. I definitely flipped. Around 2 o'clock that day, if my memory serves me correctly, I went from being just fine breathing to not breathing. We've all experienced this, going fishing as a little kid, and you catch that first fish. I know this is how I remember it, and Alfred Johnson takes that thing off the hook, he pitches it on the bank, and that fish lays there. And what's he doing? I felt like a fish out of water. I mean, it happened so fast. You know, my oxygen levels dropped from low 90s to low 70s in a matter of 30 minutes. My wife's racing to get an oxygen tank to me from my office. She's coordinating with my colleagues. You know, we're trying to get their stubborn husband, the stubborn colleague to get to the hospital and really in a semi-race to get there. We show up at the hospital and at this point, the invincible has been humbled. I'm in complete physical submission to this disease. I have no ability to do much of anything for myself. Amanda pulls into the, the ambulance bay. People come out. She turns her husband over to the medical staff there. And she's not allowed to come in. Y'all know how this is. You know how it works, even for me. And I'm rolled back into an ER room. And it's the first time I hear, Evan, it's the ER doctor. It's 
speaking to me. We need to put you on a ventilator. And that quickly. And uh, I don't panic. I am fearful. I don't like the thought of a ventilator. And I said, let's just put me on some oxygen first. Let's just see how I go. And that worked. Subsequently, I was admitted to the ICU, placed on a form of oxygen called Aerovo, and I was holding my oxygen well. I was like, mm, yeah, I'm good. Superman's cape's starting to come back. You know, I'm breathing. I'm looking at my levels. I know what's going on. So we're there. During that day, you know, as I watch and I watch, that was into the night, things start rolling around my mind. I'm separated from Amanda. I'm separated from my kids. And I'm sitting there by myself and I'm thinking, when I walked out of the house to go to the hospital, I barely had enough air to tell my kids bye. I gave them no reassurance that I would ever be back. I gave no reassurance to my wife that I'd ever come out of that hospital. And I started having my own doubts that I ever would too. So that complete physical submission, God brought me there. That's what had to happen first. That's the first part of this story. And I want you to look in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 7. I want to read that. Therefore, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And he was caring for me. And I was trying to allow him, but I was trying to still be the doctor. I was trying to talk my way through this, how I was going to be okay, how it was all going to work out how everything was going to be good. It's a joke now, but, you know, all Amanda ever got, we texted a lot. I couldn't talk for weeks because I had no air, but we texted a lot. And we joke now, but all she'd ever get was a picture of me and a thumbs up. <laughs> you know, and which was not the truth. I was not doing well at all. My chest, chest x-rays looked horrid. You know, my oxygen levels were holding. I was dwindling by that minute, and that afternoon, the next day, we're into the next day now, and we're into topic number two, bullet point number two. I had reached a point, I'd been humbled, I was in physical submission, and bullet point two is I'm now hoping for miracles. Hoping for miracles. The tables, tables are definitely turned. The doc is now the patient, and he's not well. For the second time, a doctor walks into my room and says, Evan, I want to put you on a ventilator. I said, I'm not that bad. I can do this. Didn't know I was breathing 30 to 40 times a minute, shallow, you know. Things were getting very dicey. My condition was critical. My prognosis was worsening. This is despite excellent care from my colleagues from the nursing staff from the respiratory therapists they're doing all they can do guys we didn't have enough as as doctors and nurses to give i mean you, you can say what you want but the medicine's not here and it wasn't there for me then they gave me everything that we had available was given to me um and i was receiving and they were concerned to the point that talking to other doctors in other states and what we're going to do for Evan and I mean they rallied they rallied but it wasn't enough and I could no longer talk I could barely even write I tried to scribble and pen what could have been my final words on a piece of scratch paper and through someone interceding for me, got that information to my wife and to my doctors of what I wanted to happen, what I wanted to see happen. One said, no ventilator. You know, there's another form of oxygen they're going to put me on. Try one more thing. They didn't believe it was going to work. One more thing. Reassure my wife that I love her. And it was all I could do to make that work. I couldn't write. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't talk. I was helpless. I want to paint a picture for you because this is when it happened. Zach, 
Yeah, I don't know if you can see, but yeah, that's me. That's a thumbs up going up. And that's the mirror. And that's me laying in the bed. And that's the monitor behind me. And it's a dark room. And that could be me, or that could be anybody else in the ICU with me at that time. Because that's what it looked like. And no fault of anybody else that are treating us, you were alone. And it was a dark place. Okay, it was dark. And they got BiPAP on, or CPAP on me. And I started breathing. And I started breathing a little better. And I felt a little more comfortable. But still couldn't talk. All you could do is breathe. And all my focus was at that point was breathe. Breathe, Evan. Breathe. Breathe. Take the next breath. Breathe. Don't go to sleep. You'll die. Breathe. Breathe. And it's like you're going down the road with your head hanging out the window at 50 miles an hour. You're not going to talk. You're not going to eat. You're just taking that oxygen in and hoping for the best. I'm at the mercy of a piece of equipment blowing oxygen in my face. And when I say then it happened, I'm talking about the troops got rallied. I'm there alone. Y'all saw the picture. There's nobody else there, but oh, there was. Oh, there was. There was a lot in the darkness. And who was carrying that light? My wife, my children, my family, my friends, my church, my patients, my community, and beyond. And what fueled that light? Prayers. Prayers by the thousands. And how do I know that? Because after I've gotten home, people have told me every day how they prayed for me. Text. My phone's going off. I can't answer them. But I can see them. I'm praying for you. 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 My wife, my kids, my family at home on their knees. Praying. Men on their knees in our fellowship hall. Praying. Hundreds of texts and prayers. From all over the world. It's amazing. I'm being prayed for in Australia, in Brazil, in the Dominican Republic. Connections that Amanda and I have made in our years of travel and in missions and with friends. I mean, it's going up globally. I'm being prayed for. And this is what I want you to hear, church. Prayer works. During the darkest part of that night, as the night went on, I made a little improvement, just a little. I was still requiring about 85% oxygen through that BiPAP machine, blowing in my face. I was getting tired. I was weak in the thoughts. Satan coming right beside me saying, right in my ear, go to sleep. Let them put you on the ventilator. You need to rest. You can't do this. You can't do it. You can't. And all of a sudden, that left. I mean, it left. Like, it had been yanked, that voice had been yanked away. And it was gone. And I started hearing voices again. <laughs> I could hear prayers in my mind individual prayers of people praying for me, telling me what they were praying for. And over the next couple of hours, that continued. Every time I'd get weak and every time I'd get short of breath, every time I'd get tired, I'd hear prayer. And more amazing than that, God allowed me to hear individual prayers that I could discern the voice of the prayer from my wife, from my father, from my pastor, and from others. And I could hear that to the point that I knew I was really hypoxic, but I'd look at that monitor, and I'm still with it enough to know that when it said my oxygen level was good, I wasn't hallucinating. I was hearing it, and I was staring in that mirror. And it's almost like I could see the prayers. It's like when Brother Mike's preaching, and we watch online, you see those little messages go up. I mean, it's almost like that's how I'm hearing these prayers. are just coming up, and they're coming up, and they're coming up. But I could hear those murmurings of prayers, groups of prayers, individual prayers. 
and I was ready to tap out and be put on a ventilator, I heard what I needed to hear. A peace was provided, assurance was given, and God did what he was famous for. I mean, he did, and he showed out big time because I was all through that night. Bang, my oxygen level got to come down 65%. A few hours later, 45%. This is what I'm receiving, not what my actual level is. I'm requiring less and less oxygen. Quickly. The next morning, I'm to a point that I can be taken off that CPAP and put back on a lower form of oxygen in a matter of less than 24 hours. That's unheard of. Took a picture of my chest x-ray the next morning. It's terrible. Worse. Can't understand how I'm breathing as well as I am. I'm holding my levels as well as I am. But I am. And I did. And I continue to do so. For the next two weeks, I stayed in that hospital breathing. I got weak. I got weak. I got so weak I couldn't walk from here to that chair. Some of y'all saw me when I left the hospital. I'd lost 25, 28 pounds in two weeks. Pale, weak, disheveled, like I said. Physical submission. The other part during this time that I'm in the hospital in this ICU, there's another story within the story. I'm sitting there with people that are fighting for me. I'm praying for them. But those, there are people there too that are fighting with me. And what do I mean by that? My very own patients that I had treated the week before are in the ICU with me. Friends and families. And if I call these names out, you're going to know them. Cleland, Ronnie, Miss Kathy Amos, Leah, Mr. Wendell Gardner all very close and personal to me are in the same spot that I'm in. And I can't do anything for them medically. Not one thing. I have to give that to the other doctors, but I could pray. And I'd get up every morning and wake up and I'd start a list. And, and I'd give a man of those names too. And we started praying. And all I could do was pray for these people. And I couldn't understand what was going on. In those two weeks, my progress was not fast. And at times, I got bitter about it. Why can't I walk? Why am I not getting stronger? Why can't I get this oxygen level low enough so I can go home to my family? We had physical submission. Now we got mental anguish. I mean, I'm struggling. The brightest part of the day is getting to see Amanda every day, getting to talk to my children who I really didn't even FaceTime them initially. I didn't want them to see their daddy in this condition. Um, but these people fought for me. At the end of those two weeks, I did get to go home. Look at your first Peter chapter five, verses eight through nine. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking, to, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. And in the ICU, you're in there too, with you right then. It was tough. You know, it's tough hearing about people so close to you while you're sitting there living that we're dying. You know, you're saying, why me? So I get home. Amanda picks me up. They roll me down the hall. They're cheering. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm a survivor. The hospital needed something to cheer about. Anytime one would leave, they rolled me down the hall and they were all clapping and cheering like I had done something. And I was trying to give God the praise through it all. You know, it wasn't what they did, it wasn't what I did, it's what he did. And I rolled to a car outside the hospital. And I was able to stand and fall into the front seat. My wife carried me home. She smiled the whole way. We're going home. If I can get you home, I can heal. We'll get you better. We'll get you stronger. And they did. And I got home, and I saw my daughter arriving from basketball practice, getting out of the car. Not very an emotional child, but boy, she was crying. Man, she needed to see her daddy, and I needed to see her. And my two boys standing there waiting for me. And with them was a wheelchair. And I fell out of that car into a wheelchair and they drove me to the front of my house and they picked me up and they carried me in there. And they carried me to this chair and they set me down in it. And for the next several days, it was tough, guys. 
I had to learn to walk. I had to learn to brush my teeth. I had to learn how to eat. And it was getting better. Miracle number one's happened. Miracle number two's coming. If you're not aware of this, a few weeks later, I'm getting feeling better. I'm starting to give orders. I'm bossing people around. We're on the farm. We've got cattle things to do. I've got Amanda and my dad and my boys doing all the things that I need to be doing, telling them how to get cows ready. And uh, we wake up one morning and Amanda said, your leg's a little puffy. No, it's not. It's my gout. You've been feeding me too good. You sure? It's not a blood clot? <sighs> not Superman. He's not going to get COVID and a blood clot. Well, I said, we'll go work the cows, and if it's still not better by lunch, we'll go up to the office and get a blood test. We got a blood test. Blood test wasn't favorable. We got an ultrasound. Results made me bitter. I've got a blood clot in my left leg, top to bottom. How'd that happen? So I'm mad. I don't need anything else going on in my life right now. I don't need a blood clot. I got to start learning how to breathe. I'm still coughing. I'm still weak. I still can't walk. I'm still there. Still hoping to survive. We ride home. I'm going to go get on some blood thinner. I call a colleague of mine that's a vascular surgeon. He said, yeah, get on blood thinner. And then God speaks to my wife. And she has the premonition to say, why aren't you getting a cat scan of your lungs? Well, I'm not any more short of breath. I don't have any chest pain. I'm fine. I'm fine. Blowing it off. Well, we talked to my pulmonologist, and I'll just leave it at that. The wife and the pulmonologist decided I needed a CT scan of my lungs. I'm fine. So we turn around and we go get a CAT scan. I walk out of the CAT scan room. I walk to the reading room, and immediately I can see it. And if I can see it, I'm not a radiologist. It's big. I've got a blood clot as long as a pencil, as big as my finger, draped across both of my lungs. The bullet's already gone by my head. I've survived another one. There's no reason. Most people who have that that enter the bifurcation of the lungs and it hits is most time instant death. And I didn't even know I had it until God showed us it was there. And here he goes again. Texts go out, prayers go up. Once again, I'm sitting in the back of an ambulance talking to my children and my wife, taking a picture of them, trying to make light of the situation, trying to make them smile. But they know daddy's leaving again. Man, I know daddy's leaving again. And I'm not in my hospital. I'm going to another hospital, another facility, all alone, separated from them again. Fortunately, God knew where he needed me to be. Fortunately, he showed me that clot was sitting there. It did not need to stay there. A gifted interventional radiologist who had done this procedure numerous times before said, let's take that out. I said, okay, let's do. And uh, the next morning, he said, it'd be a 30-minute procedure. An hour, 45 minutes later, the clot was gone. And I went home the next day to start recuperating again. Miracle number two. Uh, I've already been through two miracles. The prayers that were given for me are why I'm here. The mental anguish began to get better. And now it's time to look at the third point. The healing of my soul. The healing of our soul. During this time, and I would not know the outcome now for sure, I would not go back and want to change this. The experience of that, horrible. The experience of COVID in general for many families has been horrible. But knowing the outcome, knowing that I'm standing before you today, I'd go do it all over again. Because what it's done is it's brought me closer to God. It's brought me closer to my family, to my wife, to my church to my patients, to my co-workers, to everyone I come in contact with. First thing it was, it was revealing. Not physically revealing, but spiritually revealing. Yeah, there's a lot of physical to talk about. There's a lot to talk about, you know, how that all happened, how, how I made it through that, all the things that transpired physically and with medicine, but that's not the point. The revealing part is the spiritual problem. 
And it's the same spiritual problem that we've had since the beginning of time, since Adam and Eve. And if you don't get this, if you haven't gotten this, you need to get this today. The problem is sin. It's a three-letter word. It is the problem for everything that this world experiences. It's sin. It's not a COVID problem. It's not a pol political problem. It's not a border crisis. It is sin. It's always been sin. It always has been sin. And we'll get to that in a minute. So revealing. Second thing it was to me is it was renewing. I mean, it renewed my faith. How could it not? It renewed my family's faith. I mean, we got together and we praised and we worshiped. And we didn't have to come to church to do it. We did it right there in our own den. Right there in our own home. We played music. And we prayed and we read scripture and we had devotions. And I wasn't back to work yet. Every morning, we'd pray those kids off to school. And man and I would sit down, and we'd study his word, and we'd do a devotion together, and we'd talk. And we're like, why haven't we been doing this? What have we been doing the last 25 years? I mean, yeah, we pray, and we do our own devotions, but we weren't worshiping and praising. We weren't. But we had a daily directed time together with God individually and collectively and it meant so much and then the third point is redirecting it redirected everything for us yes i'm still a doctor and i'm still in my own in my practice but the way i view it it redirected my view it redirected our efforts it redirected our service our attitude that we look at things so much differently now and i hate to say that it had to come to that for me to see it that had to be physically submitted to God and go through a, a trial like I've never been through before, before I would wake up and see you're going down the wrong road. Get back on this one. So we chose a word for this year. It's praise. And I'm going to praise him every day. Every hour of every day. Why would we not praise God why are we not praising God I'm as guilty as anybody sitting in here you've all been in a church service where you felt there was no praise there how many of y'all been in a church service before we said got nothing out of that why are we not so through this all there was a great spiritual war that's the third part of this, too. The healing of the soul. We had physical submission. We had mental anguish. And a spiritual war going on inside of me and inside of the lives of my family like we had never experienced before. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his ex eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a little while he is going to perfect establish strengthen and settle you oh how this verse applies to me oh how it applies to you it's the word of God it applies to all of us and it's there and yet we still ask Why do bad things happen to good people? Why was I spared and someone else wasn't? I mean, these things go on in my head. Why did I live? You know I can't answer that. I don't know the answer, and I'm not even going to try to give you the absolute answer of why I'm here and someone else is not. But this is what I do know. We have to realize that because of that word I mentioned earlier, sin, there are no good people. And that's hard to say. But that wretched word separates us from an almighty God that loves us, who desires our praise, who saves us, saves our soul. And it's not because this person was bad or this person was good. It's because sin exists and death's going to happen. So you ask, why am I still here? Well, I made a list. One, you know it's going to be on the top of the list. 
prayer works. Y'all prayed for me. I know you did because you told me you did. And I know it works because I'm standing here. And God loves that. They prayed for my Abby. You know, look how happy they are. It worked. But there's sorrow there too. The second thing, and I want to read this passage. Y'all flip over to first, I mean, excuse me, Philippians chapter 1. Maybe I can do it without putting my glasses on. We're going to look at verses 18 through 21. And I want you to listen to it as we start to wind this up. But why am I here? Because to live is Christ. Because to live is Christ. What does that mean? Let's listen. Let's see what Paul says. He's suffering. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and will rejoice. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Hallelujah, Christians. If we live, it's Christ. If we die, it's gain. We gain him either way. Either way. We win. There's no losing. So for those of you that lost family members, Christian family members, they gained it all. Okay? They gained it all. And that's reassurance in that. So why am I here? Point three. These are a little different. But through this, through the efforts of my brother-in-law, our hospital system... And churches rallied together at a time that I think that the healthcare people needed support. And the churches rallied to the hospital, showing their support, giving to them their time, food, and everything else. I think it opened an opportunity up for the hospital to see what the church can do for them. And the importance of prayer, when people are standing outside the hospital, hundreds praying for a hospital and the people that are in it. They need to see the power of prayer. Oh, why else am I here? I think to bring awareness to this disease. I think God had an intent. People were getting very cavalier about COVID, and people were dying. What I've heard every day since I've been back to work is, I didn't take this serious till you got sick. I didn't think it was real till you got sick. I even had some of my colleagues say, I thought we were invincible too till you got sick. So it's a great awareness. But last but not least, I'm here today so I can share this story. And if I'm not sharing this story, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Church, I titled this, It's All About Prayer and Praise. And if we want to see effective change as Christians in this world, you need to start praising him, and you need to start praying to him. But I might put this up here, and I'm glad it's behind me. But the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man, what? Availeth much. Much. And I'm standing here. I may not be much, but it was effective for me and for my family. I love each and every one of y'all. I'll do anything I can for you. But I can guarantee you one thing, I'll be praying for you all. And I'll be praying. And I'll be praising. You're going to get a few more amens, brother mine. Not just Patrick. My brother back there. I'm stepping up too. We're going to praise. We're going to worship. We're going to love him. We're going to love each other. And we're going to carry the gospel message to this community. And we're going to start by praying about it. And then we're going to praise about it. And I'll be here with you. And I'll talk to Brother Mike after this, but I bet we can get a few people here to start praying for this community 
in the next few days. At a certain time every week, I'll meet you whenever. But we're going to pray, and then we're going to see what God can do. And hopefully we'll all tell another story.